the fog. Faith is like rider that sees through the fog. I think the reason I like Sarah and Abram's story so much is because of the timing of it all. It wouldn't have been so miraculous if Sarah had gotten pregnant earlier in life, even if it had been after prolonged uh, barrenness. No, this account gets its punch because of the timing. At nearly 100 years of age, God's promise of a child came to them. But there is another important bit of timing that took place. Can you find it? Without awakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was a good as was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not wave through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was straightened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully pers uh, persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. It is important to note the timing of Abraham's praise. His son was not born yet, so his praise emerges in the midst of his plan. He is still grapple, uh, grappling with uh, perplexing problems, but standing on the promise he received. He gives glory to God for things he cannot yet see and hasn't yet received. Belief culminates in praise. Abraham's heart, like our hearts, has the capacity to worship and give thanks based, based on who God is, because the fulfillment of God's promise is certain. Our praise of God need not waver, nor does it need to wait. Eternal Lord, I believe in you by the truth of your word and the power of the Spirit in me. I will not waver in faith in you. Fill my heart with thoughts of you today. Even when I cannot see, I will not wait to praise you. Amen. The power behind his promises to you. Let God's promises shine on your problems. Quotes from someone like Kari, Ten Boom are uh, so powerful. She let God's promises shine on her problems in the midst of the honor and death of, her, of the Nazi concentrations camps. That's because he believe, her belief was rooted in something more than the hope that God would cause her problems to go away. She experienced the true promises of God in the midst of her problems. We find the same level of belief in Sarah and Abraham. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Abraham and Sarah clearly knew what God was promising, and like them, we too can be fully persuaded that God has the power, power to do what He promises. Do you know the promises of God? Do you believe them? Jesus promised that we would know trouble in, the, in this world, but urged us to take courage because He had overcome the world. God promises that Thought uh, we walk uh, toward certain death, He will be with us every step of the way. Our Lord promises that when we are weak, He will be strong in us. 
So many of his promises seem contrary to our wishes that we would not have trouble, that we would not get sick or die, that we would not all uh, we would always feel strong, etc. But the nature of God's promises are deeper than that, and we need to be willing to let the light of truth shine on our problems too. Dear God, fill my heart and mind with the incredible promises of Scripture. Tell me the truth, reveal false expectations, and give me a belief that is convicted of the pure, life-giving promises you have made. Amen, hallelujah, amen. Replacing the next lie, faith and doubt are by no means mutually ex exclusive. Doubt is rather than the shadow which everywhere follows faith and trust. Doubt has been defined as a status between belief and disbelief involving uncertainty or distrust uh, or uh, lack of uh, sureness of an alike fact, an action, a motive or a decision. To a certain degree all of us live in this status between belief and disbelief. Sometimes we doubt when we hear the truth about who we are in Christ or read the promises God has made about the future. It is natural for our flesh to doubt when we are first exposed to the truth. Even the dis uh, disciples wrestled with this. Now Thomas, also known as Demetrius, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. He week later. He, Jesus, said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed, believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Don't feel pursued if you have doubts. You aren't being unfaithful or betraying God by the questioning what you believe. Belief is a courageous process. In fact, a sincere growing faith emerges from doubt. I think doubt to a certain degree will always be with us until that day when we can put our fingers into his nail scared hand. God, I want to call you my Lord and live with you as my God, just like Thomas proclaimed. Thank you for understanding my doubts as I uh, continually reject lies and replace them with, the, with your truth. Show me the next lie that you want to replace. Amen. Getting in God's wheelbarrow. The problem with using quotes from the internet is verifying the authenticity of the source. It's one of those stories that just gets better with time. Like most uh, good stories, it began with a certain amount of truth. Yes, there was once a Frenchman named Charles Blondin, and yes, he used to walk a 
tight rope across Nigeria Falls in 1859, doing all sorts of stuff like wearing a blindfold, carrying his manager on his back and cooking himself on omelette. No joke. He even pushed a uh, wheelbarrow once, but that's when his story gets a little fuzzy. For decades, preachers have been telling about the day that Blunding crossed the falls with the wheelbarrow and yelled, Do you believe? Yes. The crowd cheered back. Then get it the wheelbarrow. The story goes that only one man was willing to volunteer and off they went. There is even a version of this story in a noted Christian book where a man who had a wager that they would fall cut one of the supporting cables causing the wire to sway dangerously. The man in the wheelbarrow jumped into Blondin's arms who carried him the rest of the way as the wheelbarrow uh, tumbled into the white water abyss. Yes, a great story that just gets better. Too bad we can't find any record of it actually happening. But you know what? Because this is such a great illustration of biblical truth, I am going to go with it. Just don't quote me on it. Tell people you saw it on the internet and they will believe you for sure. Here's the deal. We say we believe, but do we really? God will continue to ask us to get into the met uh, metaphorical wheelbarrow on a regular basis, risking our emotions, our reputation, our money, and even our very physical well-being. Do we believe? Will we get it? Lord, I believe, to a certain extent at least, I at least believe that a great adventure awaits me if I place my trust in you. I know that the fate of a mustard seed can move a mountain. Give me an opportunity to get in your wheelbarrow today. The little bit of faith that I have in you, I give to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When your road darkens, faithless is, is he that says, Farewell uh, when the road darkens. Through Sarah and Abraham, we have learned a lot about biblical belief. Belief in God is confidence in a powerful person, comfort in the midst of pain, candid about problems, consistent in progress, culminating in praise, convinced of God's promises, courages in process. These things are the selection of belief. In the months ahead, we will be putting meat and muscle on the selector. Yes, we believe. But what exactly do we believe in? And do we really believe or is our belief tainted and incomplete? What do we do when the road darkens and all we can see are shadows and no light? In Mark 9, part 24, we find one of most honest prayers in the whole Bible. A man has come to Jesus with a son who is possessed by a violent evil spirit. 
the man desperately asks if Jesus is able to help him. Jesus tells him all things are possible to him who believes. Perhaps our most honest responses to God at this point are the same words that the father of the demonized child exclaimed to Jesus. Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Your belief and God. Do you know why most of us miss the adventure? It's because we have never learned to plug our theology into our biography. God. That is a very simple word, God. Three letters, one uh, syllable, very easy to say. We say this word in our money. We print it on our bumper stickers and plaster it on uh, billboards. Preachers say it with such a confidence as if they have the meaning of this word all figured out. God squished in a box of fancy sounding words and questions by long dead theolo uh, theologians. Too often we hear this word worn around casually and carelessly like punk, uh, punctuation at the beginning of the end of a sentence. It is even common to hear someone use his name as an outcry of pretty of petty disgust. What does God mean? Does belief in what stands behind that little word matter? The answer is an unquestionable yes. Different beliefs <coughs> about it have caused wars and have healed families. The word God has been used for great comfort and misused, causing great pain. It causes some of feel pain, peace and others to boil with anger. The simple believe anything but the prudent give through to their steps. Fools tell us that an overwhelming majority of Americans believe in God. I am assuming that if you are reading this devotional, you believe in God too. But do you know what you believe when you say that? What do you mean when you say God? As more of God's nature is revealed through the Bible in the coming weeks, I hope and pray that your understanding on, of, and belief in Him will be deepened and sweetened. God, open my heart, mind, and soul to your words as we learn more about who you are. I already believe in you, but I want to believe in your reveal yourself to me so I can live in you in new truthful ways. Hallelujah. Amen. Three big questions you must answer. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The issue of God cannot be avoided immediately when we consider our belief in God, three vitally important questions must be addressed. Do you know about Him? Do you know Him? Do you make Him known? And do you see the need for all three? To know God but to not know about Him, is it possible? 
Nu e pat ca pat not know him. Is it is uh, is that not tragic to know God but to not make him known? Is that convincible? Since the dawn of creation, these three questions about God have been central to the plot of all humanity. Consider Moses, one of the great leaders in the Old Testament. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me <coughs> your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Teach me your ways so that I may know you. It's a humble but desperate request, isn't it? We must know about him so that we can know him, so that we can then make him known. What we believe about God is the most important thing about us. God, I know some about you, but I want it to go further than that. Help me to know you more so I can love you more and in turn make you known to those around me. Hallelujah. Amen.